Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today, we've got episode number 56 for you all. I think the title of this one is just going to be Final Favorites in Trouble because going into this postseason, I'm pretty sure Vegas had it. I think we had it. A lot of NBA fans had it. A lot of NBA media had it. And it felt like we were going on a collision course for it to be a Denver Nuggets, Boston Celtics, NBA Finals. And as of right now, Friday, May 10th, this is before the, the Denver game tips off later today, uh, Denver is down 0-2 going to Minnesota. They had, like Their backs are really against the ropes. And last night, Donovan Mitchell put on a show in TD Garden and nodded up the series against the Celtics and stole one on the road against the number one seed. And we, I know you're going to have a lot to say about Donovan Mitchell. I'm sure you're going to have a lot to say about Jason Tatum and Boston in general, because they've been mm-hmm. underwhelming uh, in this, this series and this postseason as a whole, particularly Tatum. So we got a lot to cover here today. So I'm going to get the housekeeping out of the way as always. Be sure to like this video, comment, subscribe to the channel. Follow us on the socials at Off the Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off the Glass Podcast on TikTok. Um, how you doing today, Dame? How you feeling, bro? I'm feeling great, man. I'm feeling great. You know, had some good basketball games. Excited for some good ones supposed to come on later today. And we got a lot to talk about. So uh, I'm excited. I'm ready to get into it, man. For sure. Before we get into all the playoff series, bringing a new type of uh, segment to the podcast. Just right now calling it Quotes of the Week. Went through, compiled some of the, the quotes from some players, former players, media members. I just want to get your thoughts, your opinions on some of them. Um, I think I have five or six of them here. So first one I have is actually from Paul George on his podcast, Podcast P. Um, and it's his first episode back since the Clippers were eliminated. And he said, quote, it's not fun to be done at this stage. I didn't think I would be seeing y'all in person for a good little time. But here we are talking to his, his co-hosts. Uh, he said, it still hasn't hit me that we're done. You just get so used to a schedule and a rep- repetition. That always stings, and you never get used to that. Thoughts on Paul George comments? I hear what he's coming from, man. I mean, it's tough from his ass, his his point of view because thinking, like, look, we're all healthy. We're a really good team. We We have the facilities to make a long run. From the outside looking in, I don't care how many games y'all played this whole regular season. I knew somebody was going to get hurt eventually because it just happens every single year. So I'm not surprised, but I see why someone like Paul George is like, look, we've been healthy for majority of the season. Kawhi played X amount of games this year. And it's just, it's just, I'm surprised that we're, you know, we're not still playing, but like I said, from the outside looking in, I'm not surprised. Yeah. He had a disappointing playoffs. Uh, His teammates had a disappointing playoffs. Um, and nothing was more disappointing than Kawhi Leonard having his most healthiest season in almost a decade, probably, actually, at this point. Yeah. Um, just to play two playoff games. And be terrible in both. Yeah. It's, it, it's not so, it's, bro. It's, it happens. It's no more like if they're healthy, when they, it, that's over. It's a bro. guarantee. Never, you can stamp it every year. <laughs> They're never going to be healthy, bro. They're never going to have a full run, bro. Just It's over. Just give it up. Yeah. You think he stays in, in, in L.A. or is he, he's out of there? I've seen people put him in. Uh, I think Philly is the one I've seen the most, that he ends up with Embiid and Maxi out there. I think he's out of there because I like the situation that he can go to. Um, I like a, I like a Philly. I think Philly would be cool. But then again, that's another hurt superstar. So that would be kind of disappointing if you go there and Joel Embiid is hurt. Um Honestly, I like the situation with the Knicks. I don't know how that situation will work out, but I feel like that could be solid for them. Um, I see him linked to like the Magic, which would be like, I don't. I know wouldn't if, be mad at it. I the Magic be, just need another person. Yeah, they still a little ways out from really getting like, making that jump that a team mm-hmm. like OKC is made. Like they probably a season or two away. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like you could bring in a guy on a you know two three year deal who could help bridge you to that point. And I'll make it sooner. I'll make it sooner. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I would like to see him in Orlando. I think that'd be interesting. It'd be kind of cool. It'd be kind of cool. So yeah, I, I like the situations of him and other teams. So I think that I think he probably is going. Um, 
But I can see a world where they just give them a bag and they said they're like, look, let's just run it back because you know, um, they got a bunch of money. They got a new stadium mm-hmm. opening it up. Mm-hmm. Wise under contract, so it's like I can see a world where they're just like, let's try to run it back. Let's be healthy, and then they run the same predicament next year. So yeah, I can see a world where they do that. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be a real interesting off season for the Clippers. Next quote I got here is from Anthony Edwards. I think this is from this morning. Um, he did an interview with Malika Andrews that was on Good Morning America, and she asked him about the Michael Jordan comparisons, and he said he wants to be the first Anthony Edwards, not the next Michael Jordan. He said he wants people to say he has got maybe a mix of Michael Jordan in him, but Anthony Edwards has got a tray ball that makes him a little different than Michael Jordan. How you feel about him trying to, to shrug off, no pun intended, the, the Michael Jordan comparison? I think it's funny how he's saying that, but then goes into the game, does the Michael Jordan shrug? <laughs> so it's like you're kind of playing into it, but then again, you like what you're saying is different, which I think, obviously, obviously I think it plays into it a little bit, you know what I mean? Having some fun with it, which is always mm-hmm. good. But um, I see what you mean. You know, you always want to be your, the first you. You don't want to just be like Michael Jordan Jr., you know what I mean? Or like you know, how with Shingoon, people just call him Baby Yogi. Like, you don't want to be someone's like, little brother or son or however it would be you want to be the first of yourself so i get that but in a way he does like play into it as well because the games definitely are are similar um obviously i just feel like the three ball is definitely better but who's to say if michael jordan grew up in this area era with three ball that his three ball wouldn't be better so it's like it's like yeah, modern true. day michael jordan in a way so you know i i see what he means and also i do think that he probably is just like saying everybody calm down a little bit let me at least win a ring first like we're, we're yeah. jumping the gun with the comparison so We'll see what happens. I personally, because I know I know it's gonna happen because I know basketball fans. I'm just curious to see how long it takes for everyone to turn on Anthony Edwards. Because right now, there's always oh, how yeah. it happens. A young star comes into the league. They first of all, they don't win nothing. People are like, oh, young, young player on the come up. Then it gets to the point where, like, oh my God, he's elite. He's rising. That's face of the league. Oh my God, he's great. Potentially wins a ring, whatever, whatever. Then boom, a, a switch flips, and now it's like this guy sucks. He's a da 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 da. He's this merchant. I'm just I'm just curious to see how long it's going to take for y'all to flip on Anthony Edwards. Because right now, he's the golden boy. Right now, everybody loves him, which is great. I would love for it to just stay this way. But I know it's not going to stay this way. So I'm curious from that aspect. It's always a what have you done for me lately league. So Look at Tatum. You know, everybody hates Tatum now. Like, <laughs> look at, hey, I mean, people have always had mixed opinions on Jokic. But recently, people are dogging Jokic. He's down 0-2. It's time yeah, to die, and they dog piling on him. Yeah, bro. I mean, I got a little something to say with that. I don't, I'm not going to dog Jokic, but I, uh, we'll get into that later. We'll get into we it definitely later. will. Uh, speaking of Tatum, next quote is from him. Uh, coming off of last night's loss, he at his press conference said, uh, the idea that we have a super team, talking about the Celtics, he said it's twofold. We didn't have a coach of the year or an MVP. We only had two all-stars. They say we're a super team, but we didn't get rewarded like we are. Thoughts? Get off Twitter, bro. That sounds like it. It sounds like you're going back and forth with a, tw- with a Twitter account, bro. Stop it. Get off Twitter, bro. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, it's just a weird, it's just a weird quote. Like, are you trying to say, like, we're not as good as everyone says we are? So, like, don't hold us to that super team standard. Like, what is the – like, I don't know what the end goal of him saying that quote was. Um, yeah, I, I I don't get it. I, I just don't get it. it, it like I said, it really right. just sounds like he's going back and forth with somebody on Twitter or something like that. I just don't see the reason for even saying that quote. It, right, it feels like a lose-lose to even respond like that because it's like, okay, you're making it out to be like, y'all are on a super team. Why are you downplaying your team? Like, y'all, objectively, I have the best roster. Mm-hmm. And minimally out east, arguably in the NBA. Um, so it's like just bro, just own it. It's not or don't even acknowledge it. Like you don't have to really, like you it. said, go go back and forth or get too deep into it. Um, but we definitely gonna get to to Tatum and the Celtics because uh, they confuse me, bro. This is the weirdest team ever. The last couple I have here are all connected. So the first one is from Shaq, who after Jokic was announced as MVP, so congratulations to him, third MVP in just four seasons. He was on Inside the NBA and said to Jokic to his face, you know I love you. You're the best player in the league. I want to congratulate you, but I want you to hear it from me first. I thought that SGA should have been the MVP. 
That's no disrespect to you. I respect you for saying that to him. I mean, what I mean, what it's an opinion. Who cares? That was like, that was at the time, like right when it got announced. That's not the time, bro. I mean, but then again, what he's saying is like, look, I wanted you to hear from me first because that means they're gonna, you know, he's gonna congrat. Say if he didn't say that, he was gonna congratulate him. Oh my god, congrats, congrats. Then immediately after, go on talk to Charles and I'm like, look, honestly, I think Shay should have won it, which is like, you know, what I mean, I, I, me personally, I see what he means. He's like, That's I would rather fair. just say it to you now so okay. that you don't hear me saying, congrats, good job, Jokic. Then in like 20 minutes, bro, I think Shay should have won it. So that's what that's what I see what he's saying. That's fair. That's fair. It's tough because it, like watching it live, it's like you ain't have to say that. Like he just he just got the MVP. <laughs> I feel um, it. But also Jokic don't really care. So it is what that it is. too. That too. Um, but again, a lot of people thought that that was a little awkward of Shaq to do in that moment. One of those people being Shannon Sharp, who went on to then his podcast. To say Shaq should have had five MVPs. He sees a guy like Nikola Jokic that's not as dominant as him get three MVPs in four years. When you're historically great, they talk about you as a great basketball player, the GOAT, and Shaq is never brought up. I think a part of him is envious of that. Shannon said it's hard for me to put somebody in the GOAT conversation with one MVP. If Shaq would have had my work ethic, he would have had 40,000 points. He's not wrong, but damn. <laughs> yeah, spicy. The last part added was like the the kicker because yeah. if he had if he would have took that out, it, it would have been like I could I get like that's all fair criticism. Literally, and it's like that you can't even work ethic out of nowhere. <laughs> and instead, if he had my work ethic, it's like oh dang, like okay. Yeah. So yeah, the, the last part really added in the whole like would make it kind of like a beef. Before then, it was like I, I hear what he's saying. You know what I mean? It still was a little like. You know, damn, but the last part really was the kicker, like I said. He ain't, I mean, if people do have, have made that argument before that Shaq could have had a better career for various reasons, especially post-Miami Heat Shaq, like it kind of got a little ugly with Phoenix Sun Shaq and Cavs Shaq and Boston yeah, Celtics bad. Shaq. It was, it, it was bad. <laughs> um, but... He, he, look, Shannon definitely makes some good points. Shaq took that very personally, and this is the last quote I have. He commented on the post itself and replied to him and said, you took me stuck it, sticking up for SGA as jealousy of Joker. Shows how smart you are and how you say anything to get clicks. So here's some clickbait for you. If you ain't ranked in the top 10 in your profession and you can't speak on me, don't forget I know what you did to get where you at. Me jealous sounds like you're jealous. I know you're trying to stay relevant by gossiping on your podcast. We don't believe you. You need more people. And in case you forgot, I got four rings, three finals MVPs. I'm top 50 and top 75. Google me. And to be quite frank, all this new success you got, you still under me. You don't know my work ethic. I'm going to paraphrase because this is going on super long. At the end of it, he says, in the words of Skip Bayless, I'm better than you. I have it, you don't, not in my profession. And your GOAT debate, never wanted to be the GOAT. I wanted to be who you should greet me as. And then in all caps, he said, the most dominant ever, hashtag the apex predator. Damn. <laughs> the, it's the, beef we, everywhere this year, bro. It's apparently, bro. Everyone's everywhere. Just, everybody's beefing, bro. We need to pick another podcast to start beef with, I guess. Right. Like, <laughs> so. Pick a side, we coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, nah, it's just uh the the main part that got me was when he was what he said. He was like, um, oh, I know what you did to get where you at or something like that. That's part I was like, hmm, what you mean by that? You got like, info? What's going yeah, on? Yeah, like, what's, what's what's going on in Hollywood? What's going on, man? What's going on behind the scenes? But nah, I mean, like I said, I it started from really Shannon, I think, taking it a certain type of way of saying taking it in a way of jealousy of what he said to Jokic, which I can see why he took it that way, but then again, I can like like I said, from my point of view, I didn't take it that way. So then I I understand why Shaq would retaliate. And then, of course, if you're calling him like, oh, you're not in the GOAT combo, like, yeah, I must say my accolades too. Like, look, listen, three time finals MVP, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, I would say my accolades too. So I see what he means. Um, I guess it's just, it's just beef everywhere, man. It's just, you saw he just dropped a diss track? That's what I was about to say. Apparently, <laughs> Shannon responded last night on Nightcap. And so Shaq responded again with a diss track. What is going on, bro? 
Look, look what Cat Williams done started, bro. It's only May. We ain't even halfway through the year yet. Bro, this year is crazy. Everybody's beefing, bro. Everybody's Everybody beefing. got beef. Everybody Insane. got diss track now all of a sudden. Chris yeah, was, Brown out here rapping a diss track. What's going what we, on, bro? What do we... I don't know, bro. I don't know. I guess if that's what you're supposed to do right now. Is you beef with somebody, bro, boom, diss track. <laughs> Beat makers, this is their year, bro. This is their swear, year. Swear. Swear. <laughs> ah, but with that, let's go ahead and dive right into these playoff series. Um, We're going to start, since we're already talking about, you know, Jokic with the MVP. Let's go ahead and start with that series because that... Going in, we said this was the most exciting second round series. I said I think this was the NBA at the NBA finals, especially with how the Celtics is playing. I definitely think this mm. is the NBA finals now. Whoever wins this is going to be hoisting that Larry O'Brien. Um, and the Minnesota Timberwolves on the road in the first two games of the playoffs are going back to Minnesota with a 2-0 series lead and one. The second game by 26 points without defensive player of the year, Rudy Gobert, who congratulations to him. Just had, I think they said it was his first child with his girlfriend. So he missed the game um, to be there for the birthday's child. And even without Rudy, I think their defense, not to say that it had necessarily anything to do with him not being there. Minnesota's defense was even better than it was in game one, where it was particularly impressive. Mm -hmm. I've never seen this iteration of the Denver Nuggets team look this like frazzled, discombobulated. They genuinely got dogged. Like that's the best way you could put it. Jamal Murray is getting hounded, just trying to get the ball up the court. Jokic is getting hounded. He's getting multiple different bodies thrown at him. He's seeing Kai, he's seeing Gobert, he's seeing Nas Reed. Gobert is doing a great job of playing that, you know, those little dump off passes that he likes to throw to Aaron Gordon or lobs at the dunker spot. I think he blocked one of them. It was going to be a lob to Aaron Gordon in game one. Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Jaden McDaniels, Mike Conley, Anthony Edwards. They have just dogs swarming all over the court. I think the commentators kept saying it felt like the Timberwolves had an extra player on the court. And that's genuinely it what it felt like at times. It did. The rotations and the nonstop effort. So um, talk to me about this series. How are you feeling? What is your – let's start here. What is your panic level on a scale of one being like you're not concerned to ten like it is a five-alarm fire going on? What is your panic level for Denver right now going into game three tonight in Minnesota? Ten. The series is over. I it's agree, over. I, bro, I had the Nuggets in seven. I really think this is going six maximum now. Timberwolves are wrapping this up. Bro, I, I told, I literally said it on the pod. I was like, I wish I had the balls to call, to say Wolves and seven, and I really wish I did say that because, bro, that was the victory lap. <laughs> uh, bro, listen, that was the best defensive game I've ever seen in my life, like in my entire yeah. life of like watching basketball. My with my own eyes, that was the best defensive performance I've ever seen, ever. Like I did, it got to the point where I was standing up just looking at TV, like, yo. They're like, this is not fair. Like, they look no. like it looked like I heard uh, who said it? I think it was Chris Bussar. I was like, they look like suburban kids playing against kids from the hood for the first time. That was just getting outmatched, out physical, out physical, bullied, bro. just bullied, bro. I was like, bro, the, the clip <laughs> of Jamal Murray bringing the ball to court and Nikhil Alexander Walker and Jamie Daniels double teaming him, and he's just like fighting for his life, bro. I'm listening. I've I've coached little kids playing basketball before, and when they can't really bring the ball up the court without getting without like me fear of losing the ball, that's what it looked like, bro. Like it looked like, it, bro, they were just getting bullied, out physical, out match. The thing is with the Timberwolves, like they're a great defensive team, and it's really because of their size. Like there's times where the smallest guy in the court is Ant, who's right. an elite defender and is what still what six four, not six four, like six five, six six. Six four is what he's listed at. He's like six five. Yeah, I would give everybody like an extra, you know what I mean? You got it. And who was um oh my gosh, who I just was listening to a podcast where somebody was talking about oh it was LeBron with, with JJ on Mind the Game, and he was mm. asking him what makes the Ten Rules so different. He just was like length. He was like cat. Length, Jaden McDaniels, length, Gobert, length, bro, for real. He's like even Mike Conley, not that tall. But he's like Mike Conley. He got length. Like, he, he just gets it over and over. 
He got long arms. He's and he's a, a good defender. Like that's mm-hmm. the thing. It's like it's not only that they're just tall and lengthy. It's they're all elite defenders, bro. You're going from <laughs> can you imagine going against the kid Alexander Walker trying to get a screen? Then here comes Jaden McDaniels off the switch. Then, <laughs> off the switch, you maybe get past him as two seven footers in the paint and Ant Roman. What? Yeah, you're. Bro, how are you scoring against that? You're just not. And bro. Jamal Murray, let me see. Jamal Murray, this last game, had eight points. He shot 16% from the field, bro. He's having a terrible series. He's getting boxed. Like, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. He's legitimately getting boxed. And to have, like I said, to have this type of performance without Rudy Gobert is also crazy. Shout out to Cat because he's playing amazing on both ends of the floor. Um, like he's playing great. He's playing great defense, obviously on offense. He's doing his thing and credit to him for, I believe last game, I don't think he was in foul trouble that much. I know he picked up that early one and they, mm-hmm. I felt like the whole first quarter, they were trying to give him the second one. Um, they probably threw the offensive game off a little bit if I'm being honest, but you know, he, he's playing great. Um, yeah, a scale of one to 10, this series is over, bro. Like the Wolves, they might get swept, bro. <laughs> they if, legitimately might get swept. If the Timberwolves sweep the Nuggets. Anthony Edwards is like, this has got to be the most impressive playoff run I've ever seen from a 22-year-old. I don't care what LeBron did. This is ridiculous, bro. It's insane. It's insane. Like, we, it was just a couple episodes. I think I said, I was like, soon we're going to see a young team or a young star get over that hump. We're talking about how Tatum don't have it. They don't have a Mm -hmm. ring yet. It's like he's still 26. You know, a lot of guys didn't get their first one until like 27, 28, or in their 30s, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like, bro, Anthony Edwards genuinely might get it this year at 22. Yeah. yeah. Like, I yeah, don't – it's it's crazy to think about. This team is – like you said, I think this – that game, game two, was probably the best defensive performance I've seen in my life. Like, that looked like pro-am. To a bunch of lockdowns all bro, over the court, bro. Bro, I swear to God, that's what it looks like. It looks like you're going against an elite pro team with two locks pressing the ball and they in the passing lanes. Like, it's you can't do nothing about it, bro. It's just, bro, the Wolves just match up. The reason why the first time when I was like, I really wish I had the balls to pick the Wolves is because if you just strictly look at matchup wise, they're the best matchup for the, the Nuggets. Like, they match mm-hmm. up perfectly against the Nuggets. Yep. Um, and it was even evident by them winning three games in a regular season against them. Like, they are they match up too well against them. Like, anytime you've seen Jokic struggle in the playoffs, like, if, for example, like the 2020 Lakers team, they had three bigs, three great def- – well, good defending uh, big men, just big bodies that were uh, wearing them down or or just – just throwing bodies at him. Just throwing bodies at him, making him work for everything. You're not. You're never gonna fully stop him, but you're making him work for everything. Even with the Timberwolves, honestly, they're doing even a better job of it because they're also pressuring the ball. When Jokic tries to bring the ball up the court, you see Nas Reed. He's just up there, like making them work for it. So the Wolves just match up too perfect with them. Um, they don't have the problem is they don't have anyone else that can like create besides obviously Jokic sets up everybody up. But then Murray, if Murray's struggling, they're not. They don't win anything. Like, as great as Jokic is, if Murray struggles, they have no chance of winning the championship. So, Yo. that's the biggest thing. They're frustrating Murray. They're frustrating Jokic. I've never even seen Jokic play this bad before. Like, he's playing terrible. for his, Especially for his standards, he's playing terrible. So, yep. they're just they're just doing a really good job, bro. Like, they match up too well against him. So, to me, it's it's Raps, bro. Series over. I, I, I would have given the Nuggets a chance. Obviously, I know how resilient they are, and they showed that resiliency all throughout the first round, obviously being down in every single game that they won and came back in every single one. But the Timberwolves genuinely look like they took their soul in game two. Like, you just saw them get – the Nuggets get deflated as the game went on. They're getting frustrated too. Right. You saw Jokic make just bad – like, plays that you don't see Jokic make. He's – trying to force passes. He's throwing the ball out of bounds. He's turning the ball over. He's being super inefficient. He's obviously frustrated. Jamal Murray, I think, should have been suspended. Like, I feel like that's kind of so. crazy that him throwing a heat pack on the court. He got a hundred, a $100,000 fine. Sounds like that was like they try to give him the biggest fine possible to not give him the suspension. But 
uh, come on, you threw something, I, whether it was intentional or not. Like I could see him just being mad and he just was throwing it and it just happened to slip out. But like at the end of the day, like somebody could have landed on that, rolled their ankle. Like that's a bad situation waiting to happen. Like fortunate nothing did come out of it, but he's lucky he didn't get suspended for this game three. He threw, bro, he threw, he threw two things. He threw the towel and he also threw a heating pad. Then he also signaled to the ref the, the money sign, like I getting paid off. Bro, he's completely out of his, his who i didn't even see that he nah he, bro. bro he literally went to the ref not went to the ref but he like see what the ref was like the money sound like yo y'all getting paid off like this is crazy i'm getting you out. might be getting paid off you might be on your jonte porter trying yeah, to hit no. your unders bro <laughs> bro uh, it's, i would believe that more than i believe the refs are officiating this series any differently to try to get the timberwolves to win what benefit like between guys doing this and people want everything to get reviewed like bro we got to use some common sense here in what world, what do the refs have to benefit here by, or, or even if you think it's from the NBA, why would the NBA want either of these small market teams? Seriously. Like, if it, it's about money, right? If that's what you you feeling like it is, bro. It's not, it wouldn't even make sense. It doesn't. They, but they, listen, they, that's what happens when you get frustrated. You start blaming the refs. You start blowing stuff. He's just, I, his, his head is, it's he's done. Because, like, he doesn't want to talk to reporters. He's, he's. He's just done, bro. He's just done. You got Mike Malone getting in the rest face and not getting a t- that, that should have been an ejection. He didn't even on the tech. court. He didn't even get a tech. I'm like, yeah. bro, what? Like, I think personally, I'm cool with it not being a tech or an ejection. If all of that, I would be fine if all that type of stuff was let go. It's the playoffs. People but it's get not heated, like fine. But it had just got a tech for staring somebody down after a dunk. Right. And Michael Malone walked onto the court and is screaming in a ref's face and can't even get tech. That's to me, to me, honestly, watching this series, and I don't I don't want anyone to get like it's just for, for a basketball aspect. I don't care if you get thrown out. Like I just want everyone to be full strength and playing. That's an ejection. Like that, bro. To me, from my eyes, it's, I've seen the Nuggets get away with more stuff than the Wolves this whole series. Right. There's plenty of times where Ant is going to the basket and he's getting hacked and nothing's getting called. And he obviously he has a normal reaction, but he gets right back on defense versus Murray. That's like this or like throwing heat packs and crying. Like, come on, bro. That's 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 mad corny, bro. It's mad corny. I literally watched the play where Ant got both arms hacked, threw the ball up, lost it, and it's no call. Like, I've seen them get away with way more stuff than the Wolves, but to cry and complain just because y'all are getting bullied and y'all are getting just flat out outplayed. It's embarrassing, bro. And that's that's the main reason why I feel like the series is over. Because talent wise, and the fact that obviously you have the best player in the world, like from that aspect, it's it shouldn't be completely over. But I think mentally they're done. Like I think, like you mm-hmm. said, they the, the wolves took their soul, bro. I think mentally they're just they're out of it. Yeah, they uh they're doing a great job, which like like you said, had kind of been the recipe before of like you have bodies to throw at Jokic. And you have good complementary defenders to make his other options, like take those away from him. And you really like put this Nuggets offense in a little bit of a stranglehold. Now, the Timberwolves have done it better than even the 2020 Lakers are able to do. Or we really right. anybody has been able to do um, since this, this current iteration of the Nuggets team has been put together with, you know, the additions of, you know, KCP, um, Christian Brown and those guys who were able to win the championship last year. Um but like you said, Jamal Murray has not been able to get anything going this entire series. Michael Porter Jr. was one for seven from three in this game. Aaron Gordon got off to a good start, but like it, it meant nothing. Like they were, I think he got the first basket of the game and they were up 2 0, and that was the only lead Denver had in this entire game. It meant nothing. Jokic is getting put, he's getting defended one on one. They're not other teams are trying to double him or send bodies at him. They're just gonna, they're gonna be content leaving Cat or Nas or Rudy on him one-on-one, and everybody else is just playing straight up, play play their mans. They're denying passes. They're mucking up screens, like you said. You can't – there's no matchup that they can hunt. No. In the, in the past, it would be like, let's go after Cat, but Cat has really morphed himself into a great wing defender, genuinely. Yeah, exactly. Get out yeah. on the perimeter. We saw it mm-hmm. in the previous series, go out against Kevin Durant, and really use his length and his side and his quickness to keep up with him and disrupt him very well. And now we see in this series, he's using his size and his length on Jokic, and he can still get out and switch out onto MPJ 
or play on, you know, with Aaron Gordon, the dunker spot. And just everybody on this team is so well connected. They're so versatile. I cannot, cannot say enough about Jaden McDaniels and Nikhil Alexander Walker, like the job that they're doing on the perimeter. No on order. No on order. That's the mm-hmm. best. I whoever that's, came up with that hard. nickname, bro. <laughs> they need to put that on t-shirts, bro. Uh, that is a great nickname. Um, the way that they've defended Jamal Murray really has hasn't allowed them to, to get into any type of two man game, any type of those, you know, the the pick and rolls that they want to get to, some of those DHOs. Jamal Murray's a guy that likes to come give the ball up and then kind of go down towards the, the baseline and come up on those crow DHOs. It's just everything is being mucked up really badly by this Timberwolves defense. So I think in this game, uh, J.D. McDaniel scored five points and had the biggest plus minus on the team with a plus 26. Yeah. Like, and, and to his point or to his credit, he's also playing a very good offensive postseason as well. Um, he like he's had a couple, series. Right. He's had a couple of games where he's gone over 20, 25 points. Um, some, you know, the, the shots have fallen for him on a couple of nights, but that's not even needed for him right now. Like, He's just devoting everything to the defensive side of the ball when they sub in um, Nikhil Alexander Walker as well. He's another guy who's coming in and he's hitting big shots on the offensive side as well as he was literally smiling, clamming up Jamal Murray. Like he's really taking pride in the fact that he was a guy who came into the league as a very questionable defender and had bounced around a couple of teams, and he's really found a home here in Minnesota just by fully buying in on that side of the ball. And, like, to the point now where they have the defending champions in a position that we've genuinely never seen them before. We've never seen this Nuggets team get this frustrated. We've never seen them struggle on offense as much. Jokic is, like, I also think defensively, like, these first two games he's been awful like yeah, he's ne- sure. I've like again, Jokic is never going to be the greatest defender. You got to give him, you got to give me something, bro. I'm but, watching, and he's not even like blowing past him. He just like turns he side the time. Him. Yeah, right. Like you got to give me something. I understand you don't want to get in foul trouble. They're going to get downhill and attack you. It has to be more effort. But again, all of that goes back to the frustration and the the fact that. The, the Timberwolves really just punked them. And I don't know. W- game three is really going to show us what this team is truly made of. Because like you said, I think this this series is over. It's 100% over if they lose game three. Mm-hmm. Um, but just depending on how that goes, if they come out with a renewed, you know, focus and intensity, you know, I, I, I expect them to have some fight based on what I've seen from them. But they very well could just come out. Minnesota is going to be rocking tonight. <laughs> um, and they lay down in game two. And if they lay down in game three, that's going to be really disappointing. And the discourse on, on Twitter and on ESPN is going to be nasty, especially because Jokic just got the MVP. Oh, boy. <laughs> They're going to be on his head crazy. What? Why does that always happen? Why is it? Why does it seem like the MVP as soon as it's given out is at a time where the person who wins it is like doing bad or like, like last to, year? With they Yogi. just give it out at the end of the regular season when the votes right. come in. Give it out because y'all give this to Dirk when after Dirk got eliminated. He's here <laughs> in the press conference mad because he just got <laughs> swept. Bro, I don't get why they why they do it that way, bro. It's yeah. always like they did it with Joel and B last year. Cause then it goes into people saying they shouldn't have won it. See what happens. They not even right. like bro, that has nothing to do with their regular season, bro. Right. Whatever you Jokic could score zero points these next two two games. He still could deserve the MVP because it was a regular season award. It's just funny how that works. But yeah, <clears throat> yeah I just I think they're done. Um they just I don't know, man. They just got the recipe, bro. They just because the crazy hey. thing about it is they have, they're doing all this, and push comes to shove. If they just need Ant to just go nuclear, he still can just do that. Like, this his last game, I feel like he, he didn't have a slow start. He just wasn't really that needed. Yeah. Um, And then had, a, like, a few moments in the second half of the game where he was like, all right, cool, it's my time to kind of take us home a little bit. They still have that in the back pocket of him just, like, absolutely going off and winning them a game by himself. Like, all right. it, bro, it's, this, this team is just – very well constructed. It's just funny to think about now last year that when they played this series. Remember Bruce Brown said that was the hardest mm-hmm. series they ever played. But that series had no Nas Reed and it had no who else? No Jaden McDaniels because he Jaden McDaniels. That's what it was. 
after the regular season game and missed the whole playoffs. Right. So who knows? Like, you know what I'm saying? It's just a lot that plays into, like, looking back at it, like, okay, wow, this team is really well constructed, yeah. which gives them credit because I was even a person that was like, Rudy Gobert trade was dumb. I didn't think it was a smart trade. I didn't think the two bigs was going to work. So I didn't either. Listen, you got us there. You know what I mean? But to be fair, didn't think Cat could defend on the perimeter like this. I didn't nope. think he'd be able to be at the four. So, hey, he's he's doing this. I forgot the guy's name that constructed this team and the, and the Jim Connolly. Yeah, yeah, that's. <laughs> bro, I saw a tweet that was like, "Bro, it's like he about to go turn the Pistons into contenders next." Like he's just constructing all these championship level teams, which is crazy. He's but, that's uh, like that's like a two K my league challenge. Like facts, build a championship team and then build a team <laughs> to beat the championship team. That's genuinely, <laughs> what he just did. Yeah, that's, constructed that's the Nuggets, made it to the point where it feels like no one else in the NBA can match up to Denver. And then left and built the only team in the NBA that can match up to them. I mean, it has we, them up 2 0. I guess we got to give more credit to, to that philosophy. Cause if we think about it, we always kill teams that, like the Warriors, right? Where it was like, bro, the, the, the apex predator, so to say, is a big man. You know what I mean? Y'all want to be small. Then we watch them get Yoke, get two centers and, and pay Nazarene as well. So they have three centers all getting paid. And we're like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? When in reality, it's like, this is why it's the right, can yeah. beat the defending for, chance, for so. these moments. If you want to yeah. have those, I've said it so many times. If you're in the Western Conference and you know the defending champion, the best player in the league is a seven foot, 300 pounder from Serbia, you have got to try to beat him. If you have any type of real title aspirations, you have to construct a roster to beat him because you're going to have to go through him. No mm. matter how you want to slice it or dice it, first, second, conference finals, whatever round it is, you're going to see Denver. Yeah. So, so yeah, you, Tim Connolly, man, he's – that's a crazy accomplishment. If they're that's able if they to win close this one out and, yeah, and win the championship, that is a crazy accomplishment. Thanks. Um, Do you think Denver, Denver wins game three tonight? I don't know, bro. Like – my, all right, this is the thing, right? Denver has not played good this whole playoffs. Just because they beat the Lakers in five games, I said it, they did not play good. We just can't execute. That was the main thing. They weren't playing good. They always got off the slow starts. They were always down at halftime. They just went on a third quarter run. They ended up closing out the game better. Had two game winning shots, which is credit to them. Don't get me wrong. But mm -hmm. they were not playing good. So, like, the fact that they're not playing good now against a better opponent and, like, showing – even more against them, it does not come. I mean, obviously, it's surprising because I didn't think it was gonna be this bad. But like when you look at it, it's like okay, they weren't playing good the whole playoffs. So I don't, I really don't think they win this game because I think that the Nuggets are a team that's, which is funny to say, but they're they're they know the moment and they're not gonna let up. Um, right. so, well, because Anthony Edwards is leading this team, um, which is funny because like in the past, the number the Timberwolves was always like a like a I don't know like a silly team. I guess it was always like a like. Always mess something up or just did some dumb cat getting foul trouble, just doing something stupid. But now since Anthony Edwards is kind of taking on that leadership role, I feel like they are more willing to like to seize the moment, I guess you could say. So I don't think that they let this one go. I, I see a there's a world where the Nuggets can win this game. And then, you know, now it's like, you know, hopefully you win the next one. But I just if I was a betting man, I think I'd bet my money on the Wolves winning this one going up 3-0. They go up 3-0. It's Man. not going back to Denver. They go 3 0, it's not going back to Denver. What are the conversations that are going to be had if they sweep this Nuggets team? Because that, like you said, it's, it, we this I wouldn't even be entertaining this if it was reversed in the first two games was in Minnesota. Right. But the right. fact that y'all they stole both in Denver, like this is a very real chance that Minnesota hasn't lost a game in this playoffs. They're the only team that has <laughs> not lost yet. Exactly. Now that OKC dropped their game to, to Dallas last night, Minnesota's the only team that hasn't lost yet. If they sweep the Nuggets, bro, the conversations that people are going to start having about Anthony Edwards are – they already feel like they're up here because people they're are – They're already up there. I still think it's a little bit too much to be going face a league. But, hey, maybe I was wrong, bro. Maybe <laughs> I'm wrong. I mean, if he – all right. If he sweeps Denver and wins the chip, because that means he would have to beat Boston in the championship, 
the defensive league stuff is is not too early at that point. Like, bro, he just took out the best put not the best player in the world. Right. Don't the you best gotta put him in, in the quotation. League. Mark, I'm yeah. I, that's why I took him away. I'm not putting him <laughs> in quotation. The best player in the world and the best team in the league. That's the face of the league to me. Like yeah. I, that's the face of the league to me. So I think so. I think if the Wolves, I think if the Wolves win this game, it's a sweep. They're not going back to Denver. I think if the Nuggets win this game, I can see a world will it world where it goes. Six. I can see a world where it goes six, possibly I, five. I don't think I don't think there's any way it goes seven. No, no, no not at all. No, yeah. no. Wolves is it's unless they just melt down and drop both of these at home, then it's like, all right, now we're just that was a series, you know, that's right. a normal series. And then now it's probably gonna go seven. So but I just the way they're playing, the way they're playing, and the way the nuggets are playing, I don't see a world where it goes past six games. I I the last thing I want to say, I just don't know if, if I'm Mike Malone, like what. What button can you press? What adjustment is there to make? Because it's not, like I said, the last game didn't feel like a schematic issue. It felt like y'all just don't got it, bro. Y'all are getting out muscled. You're getting out dogged, out physical. Like there's no other players to bring in. Like he had been playing um, Justin Holiday. He brought a nice, you know, spark the shooting off the bench. It, that's not going to do it, bro. And it's the rest of that bench is thin. We like we talked about that being their only real weakness is that they're not a super deep team, but it didn't matter as much because their starting five was so dominant. What happens when that starting five is looking pretty weak? Yeah. Y'all might get swept. I mean, the only is there's no adjustment. The only thing I can think of is play faster so that they don't set their defense. But Minnesota's way more athletic than yeah, so I don't Jokic know how don't that's got that kind of pace. It's not either, their in their bag. That's what they don't have no one. That probably, they don't have no one that can create a shot besides Murray and Jokic. And Murray is in a he's in Straight jail, jacket. so <laughs> he's nothing he could do. Like yep. it, it's uh, which is crazy to say that like the best we always said the best starting five is just outmatched right now. Like they have Wild. now. Now we're seeing like. Or they're weak here. They're weak here. When it's like beforehand, it's like, nah, they were the perfectly constructed starting five roster, like in the league. So, yeah, that's crazy, man. Well, tonight is, is, yeah, tonight is going to be a crazy one. Los Um, Angeles Timberwolves, man. Let's get it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Transitioning to uh, the, uh, the original favorite out east, who now is also arguably on the ropes a little bit. Uh, Boston loses. Badly, fans are leaving the the TD Garden with like five six minutes left last night. They lose one eighteen to ninety four to a Cleveland Cavaliers team without Jarrett Allen still, who's been dealing with the rib injury. Um, I know you are a huge Donovan Mitchell guy, so I'm not even going to spend guy. a ton of time. I'm going to turn it over to you quickly. What have you seen from Donovan Mitchell, who was a plus thirty eight in the game last night? What was working so well for him yesterday? So, listen, I just want to say, my man Donovan, Donovan Mitchell needs more respect, man. And this is this is not – this is coming from – he was in Utah because I'm personally not surprised. And I feel like the more and more great playoff games that he has, the more and more games that he takes over, um, people – I feel like more and people are like, oh, my God, like Donovan Mitchell, da, da, da. He's been doing this since he was in Utah. Kind of had like a similar like Jalen Brunson type of – team in a way just in a way of like he's just the offense there like he's the guy that kind of gets them going in a way to where he, he's taking over games um having 50 point games having 40 point games carrying them carrying the team on the offensive end and I think that one series last year we kind of struggled a little bit against the Knicks kind of skewed people's like view of him but bro he's like bro he's legit he's one of the best players in the league like there's te- bro even in the the Orlando series in the game six that they lost where he scored every single bucket for them in the fourth quarter. It's like, he just needs somebody to step up and come along with him. Like he's the capable of carrying on that type of offensive load. And you see that even in the game last night where it's like, bro, he can, he can legitimately take over the game and he just needs somebody supposed to be Darius Garland or whether it's Evan Mobley, just somebody, somebody, to just give them anybody, please. anybody. <laughs> We're just asking for anybody to come along for the ride, and then he can take you home. So I feel like that's what he, he's been doing that the past few games. I kind of had a slower start to the playoffs. This uh, this playoffs, they kind of stepped it up after I believe it was like game like five on from the Orlando Magic series. And then you see it here, like being able to completely take over the game against arguably the best team in the league. 
Like, he's capable of doing that. So I just think that in a world where he's giving you 40-point games back-to-back, like, he just needs a little bit more respect. No, nah, he was sensational last night, like, on all fronts. He ended up going 10 or 19 from the field, 5 or 7 from 3. Some tough pull-up threes that he made, uh, both off the dribble and coming off of the screen. Uh, his passing, I think, probably impressed me more than anything last night. He had a couple of nice pocket passes to Mobley. I think he had a lob to Mobley as well. Um, he just felt very in control. Um, and in that second half, especially, I think he had, what was it, like 15 or fifteen or 18 in the third quarter. Mm-hmm. Um, it felt like every time the Celtics were, you know, throwing a punch trying to get back in, it was like Donovan Mitchell's right back, right back, always with a timely answer. Uh, we know him to be one of the best playoff risers, so this is not anything new. Um, we've seen it all the way back to young Donovan Mitchell in Utah. Um, mm-hmm. He's continued that, you know, here in Cleveland. You mentioned, you know, Darius Garland struggled this playoffs. Uh, his efficiency has been better the last couple of games. Uh, he didn't take a ton of shots this game. I think he ended up going five for eight, but he was four or five from deep. Um, Evan Mobley was has been super impressive on the defensive end, both in the Magic Series and this one. Uh, but he ended up getting really aggressive, ended up with 21 right. points um, in this one, which was super impressive. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I think obviously no Chris Apps for Boston is, is hindering them a little bit. Um, they have to lean a little bit more on guys like, you know, Al Horford and Xavier Tillman and Luke Cornett for, you know, more extended periods of time than they'd like to. Um, and Evan Mobley was able to exploit that. Uh, and, and I think a big thing, uh, especially without Jared Allen that I noticed from last night's game, is they just needed – a couple of guys to come off the bench to give, you know, Mobley a breather at times and just keep stuff in a decent spot. Right. Um, so I do have to give credit to George Yang. I got to give credit to uh, the Morris brother. And then it's crazy to say in 2024, <laughs> Tristan Thompson is logging legit playoff yeah. minutes. And he, he don't look half bad, man. He, 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 yeah. he, he had a zero plus minus. He played 10 minutes and the game was the same way when he was that's on That's good. The that's, that's good. That's all, look, that's, that's <laughs> all you need. Don't help us lose. But put it that way. Right, because they their they their defense takes a huge hit when Mobley is not on the floor. So just being able to come in and provide some type of stabilizing presence to give him a breather was huge. Um, so so shout out to the three of them, and obviously Karis Levert, Karis Levert comes in, gives you twenty one points off the bench. Um, he's had a great postseason so far um, mm-hmm. as well. He stepped up a bunch in the Magic series. So look, this Cavs team is. I thought this would be a five-game series at most. I guess it still could be a five-game series. They didn't lose a game. They went to seven in the first round against the Magic, but they didn't lose a game at home. So they're going to Cleveland now with one already in their pocket. Um, I think there's a very real chance that they split in Cleveland and we go 2-2 back to Boston for game five. And The Celtics team is underwhelming. They are underwhelming they should have never dropped that game to miami now granted anomalies happened miami had a ridiculously hot shooting game so i'm not gonna sit here and dog them like crazy for that but i will dog them for this game because there wasn't anything ridiculous it wasn't like anybody got on a crazy flamethrower they were just genuinely outplayed on multiple facets of the floor Mm-hmm. Jason Tatum is having a very mediocre postseason. Very. He averaged almost 27, uh, 27, 8, and 5 in the regular season. He's down to 21 points, 21.7 points um, so far this postseason. It's not a huge deal when y'all are winning games, but in a game like this where somebody needs to step up He's got to be able to, you know, get to that next gear and be that guy that was an MVP candidate. Um, I, I think that the peop- that people, especially on NBA media and NBA Twitter, get on Tatum way more than is deserved. But this type of performance coming off of all of that noise and all the criticism that people have given him, like that's kind of the reason why Mm -hmm. like you can't be in this position 
where you've been coasting really this playoffs. And, and to be fair, he's had a great on off numbers defensively. He's still locked in. He's a, he's still a great playmaker for his team. Like he does a lot really well for his Boston team, but sometimes you got to go out and be that guy. Anthony Edwards is being that guy. Donovan Mitchell won this game. The Cavs won this game because Donovan Mitchell had moments where he was just that guy. He took over in that third quarter. Sometimes you have to step up and be that guy. And he's not getting to that, that gear. And this is not good because it's only the second round. Like from a guy who got to the finals and had a, you know, really an objectively bad performance there to where people are talking about, maybe you ain't even the alpha on your own team. This is not the type of response that I want to see from him. I, I, I'm a big Jason Tatum fan, and uh, I'm disappointed with his performance. Like I said, it's not terrible, but when you're a guy that's in MVP conversations, the criteria is a little bit more strict. You have to perform at an even higher level, um, and he has not risen his, his level enough in this playoffs for me. Uh, and like I said, now the Celtics are in a position where – They've got home court stolen from them. So uh, they're going to have to try to go to Cleveland now on Saturday and get that back. But there's some concerns, obviously, already with the injury to Chris Stapps, um, which might keep him out this entire series. And I don't know what the, the timeline is for Jared Allen to come back, but if he comes back, that's another level of physicality that I don't think that the, the Celtics have a great answer to. Um, so I, I still think the Celtics will win this series. I think it'll be closer than I was anticipating or really it should because of how good the Celtics team is. But my, if I had to give them a panic level, it's at a, it's at a nice like four and a half right now. I'm not outrageously concerned, but it's enough to know it's there. For, There's uh, some, some issues. For the series there. or the, them winning the chip? Really both. Okay. Well, right. I'll take that back. For them winning a the chip, it's at like a seven or eight because I don't know what they're doing against Minnesota right now. Yeah, I feel you. I, I, don't, I don't know what they're doing against New York. I, knew, <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that one. <laughs> I was waiting for that one. But yeah, no, nah, man, I mean, realistically, um, like even like when the, the commentators try to compare this game to, like I said, the game two with the, with the Miami Heat series. That, not to me, same. wasn't the same because the Heat thing was like a fluky, not sustainable type of, mm -hmm. yeah, all right, whatever. They hit a whole bunch of threes. Like, what can we really do? This wasn't that. Donovan Mitchell can do what he did. You can have uh, Karis LeVert come off the bench and give you good minutes, or Karis LeVert give you good minutes. You could have, t like, someone step up and then outplay you, be more physical than you. That can happen. You know what I mean? It's not like an unsustainable type of thing. Um, from that aspect, that's why I don't feel like it's the same. And I feel like that it's even worse in the Celtic aspect. Cause like you giving this game away to a team that you're better than at home. It's really, really tough. I, like the Celtics problem is just like, I don't, when like threes aren't falling or like when they're not in like that, in that flow, they just seem like they don't really know what to do, which live or die by it. That's been their kryptonite since Joe Mazzulla has become the head coach. And that's the like that is to me that's the biggest thing. It's like other championship level teams, I feel like they can win games even when the three isn't falling. That's probably why I would be the most concerned with they had match up against like a Minnesota type of thing. Because I the Minnesota doesn't like, oh, we live and die by the three. Like that's not how they play their game. I feel like they can win games if they don't have the three ball falling. Like mm -hmm. any any other champ Denver, like I would say Miracle Denver gets past the series. If they if the three is not falling, there are other ways for them to win the game. Like to the Celtics, I don't know if they can win games like that. Nope. And especially if your best player isn't, like I said, rising to that level that he needs to be to where, all right, cool, my team doesn't have him going. We're not hitting a lot of threes. Like, let me just take over. Which I don't know if it's the way his game is, the type of shots that he takes, to where if like if it's not falling, he's just kind of it's nothing he can really do. Because him him driving to the basket to me really it's I don't know it's, it's it's just weird like Tatum to me when his game is going is when his shot is falling like when the mid range is falling when the three ball yeah. is falling when that's not going I feel like he doesn't really have much other like anything else really in the arsenal and it's tough because he's like I say he's supposed to be this MVP level guy he's supposed to be I mean he is the best player on your team but he just consistently doesn't play at a level to where the quote unquote best players in the world play at to where like 
like I said, obviously Jokic had a bad game last game, but you can count on like one hand how many like horrible games Jokic has had, even in the series that he's lost. Um, it's other guys like like even like a like a Luca, you know what I mean? Like he also had a bad game in game one, but again, it's like you're surprised when they have bad games. With Tatum, it's like, bro, yeah, like there's games where he you you can go into a game you don't know what he's gonna do. You don't know if he's gonna disappear. You don't know if he's gonna look like the best player on the planet which is tough when that's your best player and that's supposed to be like your top MVP level guy. I did. That's why I'm really concerned about the Celtics and when you go moving forward. Again, mm-hmm. I think they can win this series as well. I think they'll win it. And I still see a world where they win it in five, but realistically, I think it probably goes six now that they lost one at home. Yeah. Um, but moving forward, it makes me more concerned when they play a team like the Knicks or whoever comes out of the West, whether that be the Wolves. Oh, Mavs, OKC, okay, whoever it may be, right. I'm just a little bit more concerned now. Definitely, because look, wh- whether Tatum want to believe it or not, super team, whatever, this is the best roster, top mm-hmm. to bottom, right. in the NBA. Um, and for you all to be like the 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 top teams don't sweat, like you don't play with your food. This they love giving a, games. Right. This should be a quick, easy series. Like you said, what this loss does not feel the same way to that Miami Heat loss. Miami Heat loss, they got on a crazy heat or whatever. It was literally they made more threes in that game than they did the rest of the series. Mm-hmm. This was not a series where, or a game where they just got bombarded by crazy shots. Like Donovan Mitchell is getting whatever he wants. Um Evan Mobley is contributing. Karis Avert is contributing. Like you said, when the threes aren't falling for Boston, their offense is bad, like objectively bad. And I think they went eight for like 35 or 38 in this game, something crazy. There's a point in this game where like at past halftime, they had only attempted like 12 or 15 threes, and they usually get up like 42 or 43 a game. Um, So they're just getting ran off the line. There are times where, like, guys are passing up open drives to just drive, kick, drive, kick, drive, kick. Like, they're so dependent on the three ball. And I I genuinely think that is going to hinder them from really accomplishing what they want to because, to your point, you have to be versatile uh, and be able to win games in multiple ways. And it feels like they just get so reliant on they have to live or die by the three. and don't turn into that 2018 Rockets, man. Don't don't miss 27 in a row and blow your chance because you just keep chucking them up if they aren't dropping. Um, why, why does the Celtics – and this is another thing. Why do they always blow playoff games at home? Like, that's what I was looking up just now. The Celtics are 11 and 13 at home in the playoffs in the last two years. Remember last year? where they just could not win a game at home, but they would always go on the road to win. Like, what is it at home that, like, I just can't play good? Like, I don't get that. It's so weird. Like, I don't know. That, yeah. That's also not, They're just a weird team, bro. They're yeah. the weirdest great team I've ever seen in my life. Because, like, I get – but I would not be surprised if they blow the Cavs out next game. Very possible. <laughs> like, and they look amazing. Tandem has 40. Like, they – I would not be surprised whatsoever. It's they're so weird, bro. Yeah, so weird. That's why people don't trust them. No matter how good of a regular season you had, it's like it feels like majority of people still are like, "Boss, eh, I gotta see it." Like right. they're still like that. Which, for the record that you guys had, the the season that you guys had, the players that you guys have, it should not be like that. It's, yeah. it's so crazy. It feels like they they have played more inconsistent in the playoffs than they did in the regular season. And we're seeing teams like Minnesota in the opposite direction. Like they're getting mm-hmm. more connected and more consistent and elevating their level of play where it's like, I feel like Boston is like, they're just like letting stuff happen that shouldn't for a team of their caliber to have been so dominant all season. It's like y'all dropped one at home against the Cavs team without Arguably their second best player. Mm-hmm. Like they, they, and that's they a bad they, look. They didn't even give games. Oh, they barely gave games away in the regular season. Which is right. So weird. <laughs> like they. That was the reason why this season. I was like, okay, maybe they really got it this year because they actually weren't playing with their food in the regular season. Then you got get to the playoffs and want to act like the old Celtics. I don't know. They're just so weird, bro. I don't know. Last thing I, I do need to say, uh, Drew Holiday, quietly. 
having a bit of a stinker as well. Yeah, for um, sure. I think I just saw a stat. I don't think he's ever averaged over 50% true shooting percentage in a postseason. Um, his three-point percentage is down over 10% this postseason from the regular season. He's averaging eight points a game, um, which, again, not a huge deal if you got guys like Tatum and Brown filling it up. But if they're not – Gonna kind of need some contribution from Drew Holiday there. Obviously, we know what he can bring on the defensive end, but his offense in the playoffs every year seems to take a step back, and there's no rhyme or reason why, um, which is even crazier because you got a guy like Derek White who's averaging uh, six more points in the postseason than he did in the regular season. He's averaging 21. He is averaging almost the same amount of points as Jason Tatum this postseason. He's been better than Tatum this postseason. Obviously, roles are different. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not getting matched. You're not guarded. You're not getting guarded by the other team's best player. But if we're just being like, he's been better than Tatum this postseason. That's a problem. So when I say you got to step up and be the guy, JT, you're going to have to step up and be the guy. Because the fact that we can even have that conversation, it can't It's happen, not a debate either. It's like, like legitimately it's objective. Like, he's been better. Right. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit of concern for the Celtics. Uh, but game game three is going to be interesting in Cleveland. Um, I think they play on Saturday. Uh, let's so, get yeah. to the other game that happened last night, which was Dallas OKC. Uh, Dallas bounces back from a game one loss, and Luca, who again is definitely battling through injuries, he's not a hundred percent. You could just see him laboring on the court. He was bleeding. He got his Ankle rolled up on his knee is all banged up. Hit his tooth. Yeah, he just is getting knocked every which way to Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um, he still comes out, gives you 29, 10 rebounds, seven assists, three steals, and a block. He and Kyrie, I said it already earlier, but again, last night was a great example. They are more locked in defensively than I've ever seen them. This particularly Luca. Kyrie's had flashes in the past of him just he'll sit in that chair real quick and really get on somebody I have not seen Luca this locked in defensively and it's not again his skill set ain't changed he ain't a better skilled defender it's literally just, just effort trying. bro he's yeah. just I'm watching it he's sliding his feet he's yeah. trying to keep his body in front <laughs> of people um and it, it's making a world of difference he's got active hands uh I said he's getting a bunch of deflections he ended up with the three steals in this one um, he's diving on the floor. Like he's just, you, you can tell the, the want to is there, um, from Luca, which is, was just huge. Um, PJ Washington was a monster last night, seven of 11 from the three point line. I felt like if you let him get a look from the corner, it was dropping. Mm -hmm. Um, he was huge. And there's moments in this entire playoff run for Dallas where it feels like they turn into the lob city Clippers. Gaffer's mm -hmm. at the rim, Derek Lobby's at the rim, and it's just just feeding them easy twos over and over. Um, Kyrie had a very quiet game, nine points, two of eight from the field. So to be able to get this win, you got Tim Hardaway um, and Josh Green off the bench, big, big contributors. Um, and they combined for almost 30 off the bench. Um, so to have a game where Kyrie scores in single digits and you win is huge, and on the road. Huge, huge win there for um, Dallas. I still have the Thunder in this series. I'm still confident in the Thunder to win this series, but I knew this was going to be a slugfest of a series. Um, and it's, it's living up to the hype. I think Chet has been great uh, at the rim. His shooting has been wasn't great last night, um, but his ability to space the floor has been good for Thunder all season. I think that that will continue to be um, something they try to utilize. The biggest – the biggest negative for the Thunder last night, Josh Giddy, bro. He's like mm -hmm. starting to reach unplayable levels. Yeah. He I mean. Shea, Shea was a minus six. J Dub was a plus one. Chet was a plus four. Lou Dort was a plus one. Josh Giddy, as the only other starter, was a minus 20 in 11 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I mean, if you're not a plus defender and also can't shoot, 
You got to go. You can't be in playoff. You cannot be in the playoff on the bench, rotation, bro. Listen, bro, in the playoffs, you're not a, like I said, you're not a plus defender. You can't shoot. You got to be at one hell of a like an offensive engine or you got to be what the, the extras got to be really good for you to find playoff minutes, bro, or else you, you're going to be unplayable, bro. Realistically, because you're not bringing stuff that's valuable to the team. So, yeah, it is what it is. Definitely is what it is, man. Yeah, he looked awful. He looked awful last night. Um, and they, Mark Dagonal made the decision to come out in the second half and he started Aaron Wiggins in Josh Giddy's spot. And I don't blame him one bit. I would take it a step further. Bench him, bro. Put yeah. that man on the bench. You, you don't have time to mess around, fiddle around. It's not the regular season. Um, and I think Aaron Wiggins has was great in a regular season. I think he's been great. I think, you know, rotating with him or Isaiah Joe, whichever one you want to utilize there at that four spot or at the three spot there, I think that's the better decision than having Giddy out there because they both are plus shooters. Aaron Wiggins, exactly. I think, provides much more on defense. Isaiah Joe obviously is one of the best shooters in the, the league. So either option I think is a better choice than what Giddy has given you. Um, I do have to give a shout out to, to Casey Wallace, who came in, made some big time shots, obviously is uh, still great on the defensive end for a rookie. Um, he's playing phenomenal in his first postseason. So I, I think there's adjustments to be made. Um, I don't know if there's a ton they can do about some of the lobs and just getting battered at the rim. Like Chet can only do so much. Mm -hmm. um, but I think offensively if you don't get they don't get into the hole that like i think they started the game was like 13 to 2 like they ended up only losing by nine like going mm. down by 11 off the jump like that ended up meaning a lot um and how this game turned out and again a lot of that has to do because josh giddy is on the court mm -hmm. and not providing anything here um so i i think that I, i'm still confident in the thunder i think they're they will make some changes to the rotation um, and I think you're going to have to live with what Luca's going to give you, what Luca's going to give you. Um, you just continue to try to, to throw Lou Dort at him, Doris <laughs> putting people in the Dorfer chamber. He's going to make it difficult for, for Luca. I think that they're versatile enough around the edges defensively with, you know, Shea and J Dub and, um, you know, guys that come in like Casey and Wallace, um, or Aaron Wiggins. And I think that they can still get it done in this series. I don't anticipate PJ Washington giving you seven threes on a consistent basis. Um, but I also don't anticipate Kyrie giving you nine. So it's like, no, that's, that's say, really yeah. why this is, this is going to be a dog fight of a series. Um, I think Dagnall is going to respond um, with a couple of adjustments there. And that's going to probably flip it back to Jason Kidd to make some adjustments. And then we're going to have a real back and forth tug of war type series. So I, I'm excited for this one. Um, but but definitely, definitely interested to see where it goes from here with Josh Kitty because <laughs> he's not it, bro. He's not. Yeah. It. I mean, honestly, that's to me. I, I think the difference was obviously Luca playing better, Luca playing up to his standards, and like you said, you're not really going to expect 29 from PJ Washington. Um, but I just think that if they can have a recipe to where Luca and Kyrie play up to their level. And they just need someone to come along for the ride, whether it be hit big shots, whether it be, you know, off the bench, giving you some extra production. They can get some production elsewhere. But the main thing would have to be, obviously, Luca has to play well. He has to play up to his, you know, um, elite standards. And then Kyrie has to, has to also play up to that level. And they just bring mm -hmm. people along for the ride. And then, like I said, they've been killing them with the lobs. They just need the others to play their role and step up um, and just get a little bit more production from them. And I feel like – because I, I had the Mavs – I don't, did I say six or seven when the season for the series? Started? I think I said seven. I had well, I have the Mavs winning this series, um, which obviously looks great because they stole one at home. But don't get me wrong, it's, I do agree it's going to be like a dog fight. That's why any series that I pick in seven, it's I feel like it's going to be a dog fight, and right. I wouldn't be surprised if the other team won it in that same aspect. Um, but yeah, I, I just think that the Mavs, their recipe would just be Luke and Kyrie doing their thing and have those others step up and play in their roles. Um, but I do agree some adjustments from the Thunder could make things definitely interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's definitely necessary from that aspect if they want a chance to actually win this series. Um, but it's going to be interesting. Like I said, I think it's definitely going to be a back and forth. I'm curious to see, like, the 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 coaching back and forth, like who's going right. to react to what. Um, I think that's going to make it very, very interesting. But, you yeah, know, I think I, I can see a world. 
I think this next game is going to be huge when you think about yeah. it. Like, this next game is going to be really, really big. I guess whenever someone loses at home, I guess the third game is always kind of the swing game. But I feel like this one, more than anything, is going to be a very, very big game. Yeah, it's super interesting because Shea's gotten wherever he wanted, especially last night. He was getting to the rim, getting to the mid-range. When he needed to make timely threes, he knocked those down. Like They don't really have a great answer for Shea, I feel like. No. Um, and I definitely, and I, this is just my thought. If I'm Jason Kidd, I'm I'm not trapping him either. Like you're just gonna have to live with it, um, and just try to find somebody that can disrupt him as best as possible. Because once you start to get into rotation against this Thunder team, they have lineups where they genuinely can five out you, and everybody is a you know 36, 37 percent shooter on the floor from three. Mm-hmm. And if a couple guys get hot, like you're just going to get shot out the building. So you're going to have to live with it one-on-one and uh, try to make it difficult for him, for him on the inside between guys like Derek Lively and Daniel Gafford and PJ because I can see that being a world where eventually he tries to, you know, start trapping Shane. I just think that leads to more issues um, for Dallas. So I, I'm very interested to see how the, the coaching is going to play out in this one. <clears throat> um. The last series that we haven't talked about, Knicks are up 2-0 on the Indiana Pacers. Man, vibes are high at MSG. They playing the, the, the music. Go, New York. Go, New York. Go. Mm-hmm. They are they are riding high in New York. Josh Hart has not been subbed out yet in this series. He's still playing. <laughs> like right now, he's still playing. <laughs> he's on the court. In the, he's uh, yeah, sitting in the sitting chair, in the right chair now. and waiting. waiting for the offensive board, bro. He's still playing. <laughs> Uh, but big, big injury news for the Knicks out of game two. Uh, Jalen Brunson, who I'm confused as to how it was a foot injury. <laughs> he was, bro, like, I was like, so he was bro, grabbing was his puzzled. hand or his groin, and then they said it was his foot, the right foot. I was like, what? What are we talking about here? Yeah, I don't know how that happened. He obviously didn't play basically the whole second quarter and then came out and still outscored. Uh, or actually, did he, you know, he? He almost had the same amount of points as Tyrese Halliburton. He did um, play the which, whole second quarter, which is crazy. Yeah, which I'm definitely going to get to in a second. But the bigger story, OG Ananobi strains his hamstring and is already confirmed out for game three. Uh, his status for game four, I think, is obviously still in question two. Like, if they just can't stay healthy. Just injuries continue to pile up. Um, you know, now Mitchell Robinson is back out. Obviously, Julius Randle has been out, and Anobi is now out. I almost want to ask the question if it's because Tibbs is playing these guys so much. Like, I don't know what's going on here, but if y'all are running thin. Y'all are running thin here. Like, if another person gets hurt, we're going to have to be looking at, like, Jericho Sims or Shake Milton minutes. Like, or maybe not. Maybe he's going to play all five starters 48 minutes. <laughs> I, and I wouldn't be surprised. Honestly, the main reason why, because this is kind of going back to what you were saying about they might struggle, or the Celtics might struggle with the Knicks. I don't know if the Knicks are going to make it, bro. I think they might not have enough players when they get to that series. That'd be the only thing. So fully healthy, I hear you. I don't know if they're going to get, get that far with uh, the way these guys are falling like flies, man. But it's yeah, it, it, it's, I think it's the menace thing, bro. Like, you're playing these guys 60 minutes a game, it feels like, every yeah. single game. Surprising that Josh Hart hasn't, like, passed out on the court. I need to know what their conditioning is because these guys just – they don't get tired. Level, bro. And it's the way they play, too. It's like Josh Hart is a hustle guy giving you offensive boards. Yeah. And he's hitting big shots at the end of games where I feel like I, my legs would be done. Like, right. I don't know, man. It, it's tough. But, yeah, the injuries are getting bad because OG played – fantastic in the first half he was he was their whole offense once Jalen Brunson went down so he played great that sucks to see him going obviously his defensive impact is they're gonna miss that a lot but um the fact yeah even the fact that Jalen Brunson is like banged up I mean he ended up playing great but who knows if that was just off of adrenaline like you never really know from that aspect Mm -hmm. um so hopefully he's okay and yeah they just honestly they just been going off their guys been able to play a lot of minutes and contribute because obviously what Josh Hart is doing, Dante DiVincenzo. It's <laughs> I love it. It's it's not what is it? It's not delivery, it's DiVincenzo. That's hard. Oh, I haven't heard that one. That's it's funny. not delivery, it's DiVincenzo. That's hard. I think I see enjoy basketball post that. I've I, seen that people hard. call him uh 
Dante three Vincenzo too. That's hard too. That's hard too. But you know, I'm so saying he's stepping up. They just honestly, they're living off of their guys just playing big minutes and still playing well, which is um, I mean, hopefully it stays this way as far as like them being able to like stay relatively healthy. But mm-hmm. like I said, these guys are legit dropping like fr- like flies right now. But um, it was able to fight in this one. Obviously, it ended up coming back, especially with Jalen Brunson coming back, which is great. But uh. I don't know, man. Your your boy needs to he needs to step it up, bro. Cause I, he's just you just stop shooting. I I don't know what's I don't up under, with him. I don't get it. I don't get it. In the first series against uh Bucks. against Milwaukee, right? Like see it, the Bucks did not really have an answer for Siakam. So I get mm. it. He's you know, he's pushing the pace, he's feeding Siakam. Siakam is he had a game where he had like 36 or 38 points. Siakam was dogging in Milwaukee. Fine. When you start a game out the way that he started out this game, he was hot. He was looking for his shot. And then I don't think he took a shot in the whole third quarter. Like that cannot happen. That's when the Knicks went on their run to like the Pacers were up by 10 coming out of halftime. And the Knicks went on their run in the third quarter to take the lead back. And then now it's like midway through the fourth quarter, I think it was when he took his first shot of the second half. And it's like too little too late at this point. Mm-hmm. And he only he missed eight shots. He went seven of 11 for three. He, and bro, as, he ended with 34. That was right. the, like, I, bro, I looked at the cell and then the game was like, he had 34? It did not feel like that at all. And it, he was turning down shots. Like, it wasn't like they weren't there. It's like he's got an open look for three, and he's kicking to the corner to Aaron Neesmith to shoot a three. And Sam and Gunny's on the call, like, or am I, it was Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller was like, Halliburton has to shoot that. Like, you mm-hmm. have to take the shot. At some point, it's like third time he's gotten brought up now in this episode. If you're the guy, you got to be the guy. That's part of what makes the playoffs such an entertaining style of basketball to watch that you have the stars who have to show up and show out to have their teams win. And I think in game one, he was super passive. Um, And so I was happy to see him in game two. Um, You know, he had six points in game one. So to go from six to 34 is great, but, you cannot have these stretches of the games where he's not look. He's genuinely just not looking for his own shot at all. You can. He has to has to find a better balance between being the pass first guy and pound the ball, James Harden. Right. I don't want you to get get back in the camera. I don't want you to get all the way over here where you're dribble, dribble, dribble for twenty two seconds. But I don't want you to just forget that you are one of the better shooting guards in the league. Like, you got to get that happy medium right now where you're given 30-ish a night with your 10-plus assists. Like, that's going to be required to beat this Knicks team. Um, And so, look, they're going back to Indiana down 0-2. I think the series probably goes five or six. I was confident in the Knicks beforehand. Obviously, the injuries do give me some questions, but – you know, I just think down the stretch, it was too little too late for Tyrese Halliburton. I hope Rick Carlisle's in his ear like, look, bro, you have to stay on the gas at all times uh, because this is not going to be Siakam's series. It just mm-hmm. isn't going to be. They have – the Knicks have way more size. They're way more connected offensively. Siakam isn't a guy that's about to bang and overwhelm you with four, so they can put OG on him. They can put – Precious to chew on him. Guys who are a little bit shorter, who may struggle more with a guy who's really going to try to bang, you know, on the post, they can deal with Siakam and make it difficult for him with their length. They're going to need a guy like Tyrese Halliburton to come up big scoring wise to be competitive in this series. So I, I hope Carlisle is telling him that. I'm sure he is. Um, I would not be surprised if he comes out and is just aggressive gung ho in game three. Uh, I think they probably split in Indiana. Um, and then we see it wrapped up in probably five or six games. Um, Jalen Brunson has been – he already has scored more points than Carmelo has as a, a Nick in the postseason, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, Jalen Brunson has been on an absolute tear. For him to come back from the injury 
uh, miss the whole second half and then have the fourth quarter that he did, the tough shot making that he was able to, to pull off at all three levels, getting to the cup and ones, floaters, turnarounds, mid-range pull up. He's He keeps doing the rock the cradle, just a little tween, 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 pull up three-pointer. That's been falling for him all playoffs. Um, but the, the two biggest things I would point to for Indiana as to why they lost this game, the first I already talked about is that stretch where Tyrese Halliburton wasn't looking for a shot. Shot. The second one being Rick Carlisle left TJ McConnell on the bench down the stretch, which I think was crucial. He was the only person that was really getting under Jalen Brunson's he skin a little bit. Right. And even Easily. look, you're not going to stop him. There, Jalen Brunson was getting and ones on TJ, but he was making him work. He swapped in um, Andrew Nemhard, who again, better shooter, provides much more spacing um, for the Pacers, but he's he's given up way too much space to Brunson. So I, I think that's a big issue there. And I'm also surprised to not see more Neesmith on Brunson. And I I think he was winning that matchup too though. I, I look I, I know he will Brunson's he Brunson's gonna give yeah. it to anybody. Mm-hmm. I just think Neesmith is a better energy guy to put on him than Nemhard. Mm-hmm. Um and I think we'll probably see some more Neesmith on him now that there's going to be no Ann and Obi in game three. Like, I think I just think it makes sense. Like, if you're going to rotate guys on him, like, put Neesmith on him, put TJ McConnell on him, and let's, like, continuously send guys at him. 94 feet, bro. You got – at this point, especially with Ann and Obi, drop him. Just put two on the ball every time. I live and die by DiVincenzo and Josh Hart threes at this point. Yeah. Because – I, I would not want to be sitting here, especially with Indiana being able to play at the pace that they are offensively. I would be much more comfortable with having these guys, you know, get up, chuck threes. They're going to miss some, and we're just, bang, out in transition, out in transition every single time. So if I was Rick Carlisle, that would be my adjustment going into game three. But like I said, I, I'm so confident in the Knicks in this one, um, even with – you know, no Mitchell Robinson and, and no OG for at least probably the next two games, if not longer, uh, just because their role players are the best in the NBA right now. Yeah. Going back to what you said about uh, Tyrese Halliburton, that's that's my biggest takeaway from the game. I feel like he's acting like he's playing on the Olympic team with that a stacked roster to where he don't got to do anything offensively as far as scoring wise. He just got to facilitate. You're not playing with like a star studded roster, bro. You are the guy. Like, you need to know when it's time to take over the game and when to look for your shot first versus getting your guys involved, which is the weirdest part because he started the game off so well, like, set the tone of, like, all right, this is my night, then just disappeared, which is so, so weird. That's why the 34 points is so surprising when I looked at the end of the game because it did not feel like that in the second half. So that's my biggest thing. Just got to be more aggressive. Um, know that you're the guy on this team. You need to know when to take over. You have the ability to do it. It's not like you're, you're just a pass first guy because you don't because you can't score. Like you can score the basketball. Um, that's the biggest thing. I agree with the TJ McConnell thing. I think he was like very very good. Just as far as being a pest and being annoying, being physical. Um, just, it seemed like he was just pissing Jalen Brunson off. Even the time where I think um they started drawing back and forth a little bit. Um, I think he just he was just getting not fully getting under his skin, but he was doing the best he can as far as like making it a little bit tough for him. So that was kind of weird. The fact that he didn't stay on the rest of the game. But Jalen Brunson is just the type of guy where bro, he's elite, bro. Like he he he's elite. The fact that he is doing all this and he's just one, a small guard. We know how that conversation worked, but he's just. He's pulling through every single time. Like you can always count on him, um, no matter how t- like how tired he is, how much of the offensive load he took on the whole game. Like he's still gonna pull through in the fourth quarter, make those tough shots, make those tough buckets, those timely shots. Like, bro, he, he's he's elite, bro. He's elite. Like you said, I I agree. I think TJ McConnell should have been on him, but even then, like n- like no one was gonna full out stop him. Um, even to come back off of the injury. Missed the whole second quarter and still end up with what was it twenty yeah, like uh, like twenty some points twenty nine points is mm-hmm. insane missing a whole quarter bro right. was averaging like thirty five <laughs> in this playoffs um yeah he's he's just been elite bro he's he's an elite elite player in this league man it's 
it's, it's crazy to see. The fact that he's playing a lot of minutes, he's along with those role players. Shout out to the role players for stepping up. That's the main reason why this Knicks team is where they're at, even through the injuries, yep. is because all these role players are stepping up, hitting big shots. But, bro, he's, he, he's leading the way. He's leading the way, and there's, like, nobody that can stop him right now. The the consensus, I, I didn't feel this way, but a lot of other people, I don't think you did either, but a lot of people felt like the Knicks overpaid him when he got that contract, whatever it was, $100 million over four, four years or whatever. They thought it was a wild overpay for a guy who has never been the guy, and now it is genuinely one of the best contracts by a mile. Easily. In the NBA, it's up there with like the Nas Reed contract. Who I don't know if I'm saying I said I tweeted this out but for the people listening or watching the pod. Nas Reed is making less money than uh, let me actually pull the tweet up because he I think I said he was like the 109th highest paid player. Yeah, next year he'll be the 109th highest player in the NBA. He's making less money than Nurkic, Zach Collins. Nikola Vucevic and Jakob Pertle. That's insane value. <laughs> insane value for a guy that's contributing and playing amazing against the defending champs and the best player in the world in the playoffs. Elite value. And this Jalen Brunson contract is in the same vein because you got a guy who finished fifth in MVP voting. Nowhere near a max. <laughs> like Not even close to nah. a max contract. Special, special talent, special season in New York. I, I really do hope that they could get a little bit healthy and match up against Boston because, oh, that is going to be a series, bro. It's going to feed families, man. Boston, I need I need Knicks, Boston, Eastern Conference Finals, and I, whoever wins that, preferably Boston because I really just want them to have that fair shot. Well, not fair. They got a fair shot. But I want them to see them in the finals against the Timberwolves. That, bro. Oh, it, it's going to be cinema either, either way because if Boston loses in the Eastern Conference Finals, first take the next day is going to be crazy, bro. The, the whole NBA media is going to be insane if Boston, bro. If Boston, Boston should have no reason to lose. They should win the chip. Like they have no excuse. They have no bro because they can beat the Cavs without Chris Dobbs. Chris Dobbs can get healthy and come back for Eastern Conference Finals in the finals. So that's not. I'm not worried about that. If they lose, if they don't win the finals, it is a Huge failure, bro. Because everyone else, uh, OKC, super, super young, no experience. Should right. not lose to them. No, I don't care what the, the regular season is. Mavs, you got more experience than the Mavs. You have a better team than the Mavs. Timberwolves, fantastic team. They still don't have the experience y'all do. Like, no, there's no excuse. And they best, they and they best players y- way younger than y'all. Bro, the only excuse that they ever had if they didn't win the chip was like, you go to the finals, you play Denver, you lose in a hard fought series. All right, fine. Denver is just better. No one, right. it is what it is. <laughs> if they're gone, y'all better win the finals, bro. Y'all better, or it is gonna be World yeah. War Three on NBA media. Be, that dude that be on TikTok dancing that looked like Jason. <laughs> he he gonna everywhere. Go triple platinum, bro. <laughs> bro. He's gonna be, bro. That's the one thing I can count on, bro. Every time the Celtics lose and Tatum don't play great, I know the first thing I see on Twitter is this dude. Did <laughs> dance <on> the- <laughs> why and why did he look so much like Jason Tatum, bro? Bro, have you ever seen his actual like Twitter account? Like, no. like him, he you know, he plays into it. Like, I've seen it one time where he was like, My bad, y'all, that wasn't Tatum. He subbed me in that game and he started yeah. dancing. Like, bro, why are you playing into it, bro? What are you doing? That's funny, bro. That is hilarious. He really looked too much like Tatum. <laughs> it cracks me up. Yeah, um, the they maybe find a look alike. You see the Jamal Murray one? Yes, for the dude at Disneyland. Yeah, yeah bro. There's a Jamal Murray one. There's a Joel Embiid one. <laughs> it's so, it's so many yeah, the of Jamal them, bro. Jamal Murray one is crazy, bro. <laughs> oh my god, that is so funny. But find a look alike is hilarious. Um, the last thing I, I don't want to end the episode without mentioning this and I'm not yeah. going to rant about it. Cause if y'all want to hear me rant about it, I think I, we clipped it into a separate video and posters. So go watch the video we posted about the Suns. but 
Frank Vogel did officially get the boot. Oh, yeah. This, oh, my God. Yeah, which I, I said in the last one, if he would have gotten the boot, would have been one of the dumbest decisions in the last decade. I stand on that very firmly because, again, what 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 is a coach going to change, bro? There's so many issues with this team that Frank Vogel could not have done any better on. It's just bad personnel. Bad roster construction. There, there's clearly a lack of synergy between the head coach and the front office because what he wants is getting denied. That's just a bad situation. And now he's got like $25 million left on his deal over the next four years to not coach. So, you know what? Shout out Frank Vogel, bro. Man, bro. he's about to be a multimillionaire to just sit at the crib. Bro, one should not have any... Like, if, if he's looking for a future job, they shouldn't be like, oh, he got fired for the Suns job. That shouldn't be no knock on a resume at all. You have a defensive coach, no defensive players or personnel. Mm -hmm. He said, I need a point guard. No, you don't, bro. Why you ain't work? Why you ain't make it work? Nah, bro, you got to go. Like, it just, like, it's the dumbest firing ever. It, it literally makes no sense. This is this might be like, if you search up scapegoat, like, it will be his picture. Like, right. It's the definition of scapegoat. It made absolutely no sense. So, yeah, yeah, sit up, get paid. Anybody in the future should not look at this as like, oh, he got fired from the sun job. No, bro. It did. It was a, a, just a terrible job because you got a terrible owner. If I'm a coach and I get it, if I see my phone ring and it say Matt Ishbia, decline. I don't, I don't want this job. I don't want no. this job at all. Because what are they talking about right now? What are the reports that's coming out? First of all, the leading, it sounds like it's about to be Budenholzer that ends up being the guy that takes the job. But they said a big reason why is because they want they want a guy that's going to come in and, and fix their offense. We can't be for real, bro. bro I just... James Jones in his press conference talking about some. I don't think that Kevin Durant has ever been maximized in his career. We have to find a way to maximize him. What are we talking about? What? Like, just the it's like there's a for real disconnect between what I feel like everyone else is seeing and what the people in the Suns organization is seeing. Bro, Ishbia is about to ruin James Jones' reputation because he's gonna get be the one that's like because I don't think he's a bad GM. I think that when Ishbia came in, that's what messed everything up. Right. But now it, James Jones has to go along with it because that's the boss writing the check. So now it's gonna make him look bad because him saying that is like that's to me. If you just said the quote, I like oh Matt Ishbia said that. I don't. I didn't right. really think James Jones said that, which is I, I don't know. This whole situation is just stupid. It's just so dumb. It makes absolutely no sense. And I agree with you. If I'm a coach, I don't want this job. This is not a good job. This is not a good situation. If I'm those twenty, what well, was it, twenty nine other teams? I don't want to switch rosters or draft. I don't want to do that. No, they're in a terrible situation. Absolutely yeah. terrible. And just for context, the full quote he said, I think it was in his like exit press conference. He, James Jones, who is the Phoenix Suns GM, said that's a constant focus for us to continue to figure out how to maximize Kevin Durant. No one has done it yet. I believe we will be the first team to do it because if we can maximize him, we can maximize our entire roster. We're a better team, but that's not an issue. I think Kevin had a phenomenal season this year offensively. What? Y'all what not, they're not worried about, bro. Yeah, I don't what, know. What 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 maximizing are we doing for a 36, 37 year old Kevin Durant who still had one of the best seasons of his career? Like what and might have had one of the best defensive seasons of his career on top of him still being a historically efficient scorer, one of the best scorers you've ever seen. That's yeah. not maximizing. If I was KD, I would be offended. Like, what are you talking about? Genuinely, what are you talking about? What more are you trying to get out of me? I don't think KD is the problem. I don't think you could pinpoint any of the players as the problem. I did see somebody, I did see somebody in the comments of the video say, they, they said, I think the real problem, they said they called him Bradley Steele. I'm just stealing money from the Suns <laughs> organization. <laughs> That's facts, though. That's but facts. You, you can't pinpoint down any one player, bro. No. Nah. And if you're going to try to pinpoint on anybody, KD, one of the last ones you need to be pointing a finger at. For real. Because he's giving you what he can give you. 
for an offense that is stale with no actions, no motion, no flow, no point guard. Like it's, it's like you said, look up the definition of scapegoat. You're gonna see a picture of Frank Vogel in his son's quarter zip because that's exactly what happened. Just like a week ago, like right after their series, reporters are asking me, say, Yeah, me and Ishbia cool, bro. My job is not not even close to being in, in jeopardy. Can <laughs> this crazy and they're gonna just recycle. I feel like NBA just recycles like Boone Holzer, Doc Rivers, all these like eh, coaches that got a name. They just keep recycling them over yeah. and over and over again, and nothing's gonna change. I don't, I don't understand the logic at all. Again, if I'm Boone Holzer, this is not, this is not the job I would take. This is no. not at all the job that I would take. <laughs> yeah, the latest report from Shams uh, said that. You know, it sounds like he's going to get a deal worth eight figures a year. Um, and he said he will be tasked with optimizing Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and Bradley Beal. And what's crazy is you want to know what his first thing is going to be? He's probably going to get a point guard added to the roster. <laughs> if I was Frank Vogel, I would be – I wouldn't even be pissed because, he, like I just said, he getting the checks for free. Mm. So I would be happy. But, like, the fact that y'all are going to give him – the personnel that I was asking for would piss me off. Yeah, it would. I, it, I don't know. I, sons are just, I don't even want to waste my time with Sons, bro. It's just so dumb. So yeah. dumb. Pathetic. Pathetic. Highest payroll in the NBA next year, though. Tuh. Swept in the first round. 2019 is what switch places, though. That's the, that's the wildest quote, bro. I still can't believe he said that. Like, yeah. it, he literally made it seem like everything was all dandy, bro. We would want to switch our whole team, our roster, and our draft futures. Y'all got no draft picks. Y'all just got swept. OKC is the one seed, and they have, like, 19 draft picks, 19 first-round picks until, like, 2030 or whatever it was. They'd rather be the Suns, though, for sure. They'd rather be in Cancun right now looking for a head coach. He said 26 of the 29 teams. Like, what three teams do you think, in his mind, he thinks – are better than the are in a better position than Phoenix. I mean the Timberwolves because they just beat them the Nuggets and the Celtics that's it that's it <clears throat> that's the so you, so so then right but if you to take one of those teams out I think you would have to say the Thunder are in a better spot just like you're not his there. mind that's crazy not delusional. his mind he delusional bro that's insanity I keep seeing multiverses clips on Twitter bro they need to hurry it up bro. Same, don't get me. I, I'm about to go get some reps in after this. I told you I downloaded it, bro. It's back on the in. system. I need some reps in, man. I need some reps in. <sighs> Cannot wait. What's the official date is coming back out? Uh, 20, is, is it this month or next month? If it's this month, it's the 28th, I think. I could be wrong. It needs to hurry up, bro. May 28th, 18 mm -hmm. days. And ranked better be ready when it comes out. I'm Going giving myself, there. I'm giving myself like a couple of hours to for me get locked back in on the LeBron. It's over. I'm slam dunking <laughs> everything. <laughs> ah, with that though, that's gonna do it for another episode of the Off the Glass Podcast. As always, if you made it through the whole thing, watching or listening, we appreciate you. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Continue to follow us on the socials. Like I said, we're trying to hit a thousand followers on the IG before the end of the playoffs. We're closing in on 600. We're on a pretty good pace. We got like another almost two months until the end of the NBA Finals. So keep up at this pace. We could definitely get to 1,000 before the end of the playoffs. But again, only possible if y'all follow us. So again, at Off The Glass Pod on Instagram, at Off The Glass Podcast on TikTok. As always, I'm Billy. That's Dame, and we out. Peace.